Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, our first speaker of the day is Vincent. Vincent completed his PhD in computer science at the University of Montreal under the supervision of Joshua Benjen and Aaron Kerville, working on various forms of generative models. He is currently a research scientist at Google Brain in Montreal, and his current research interests include generative modeling and meta-learning. Um, please um, help me welcome Vincent. Right, thanks. Hi, everyone. I hope you're having a nice uh, summer school week and you're learning tons of things. Um, before we get started, a little icebreaker, fun fact about myself. During my first year as an undergrad, I interned in the solar physics lab at the University of Montreal. So I do have some uh, scientific experience. I worked on a numerical simulation for spectral solar irradiance in the near and mid ultraviolet, and I learned two things. Um, one, a few things about evolutionary algorithms, and two, that Fortran as a language is still very much alive today. Um, so this lecture is about feature-wise transformations, and as you'll get to see, they're very simple and effective uh, in modulating computation in a neural network. Um, but before we start um, this, Lecture, I'd like to be uh, interactive. So if you have any questions, please don't, please don't hesitate to interrupt and ask your questions. I do have some amount of material, so I might uh, stop questions uh, uh, at some point, but uh, rest assured, I will be available during the coffee break for further questions if you have them. Okay, so um, this lecture is inspired from a distilled article that was published about a year ago that share the same, shares the same name. If you find the presentation or the article useful and influential to, influential to your research, you can always cite it using the BibTeX entry displayed on this slide. And at the end of the article itself, there's also instructions on how to cite the article. So it's not straightforward for me to give you one use case justifying exactly why you'd want to use feature-wise transformations, because as you'll see, there are many ways in which you can consider uh, what feature-wise transformations are, uh, and many reasons why you'd want to use them. So having a clear and crisp use case for them is a bit difficult for me. Um, in truth, it's closer to an architectural feature than uh, th that, that is used for various reasons in various problem settings. Um, and you'll see that feature-wise transformations are found in a surprisingly varied number of recent approaches, spanning many research areas. Um, and we can reason about them from many perspectives, for instance, from the conditional computation perspective, the multitask learning perspective, the zero-shot learning perspective, modality fusion. Um, so uh, it's, it's, a good, it's a good tool to have in your toolbox. And uh, one of my goals in this lecture is to get you to think about and recognize application opportunities for feature-wise transformations. Another objective I have is to get you to think about learning problems that have a more complex structure than the usual input-output structure found in, for instance, supervised learning. And to think about those problems from different perspectives, um, such that you can approach your own learning problems differently. Um, the perspectives I will present are all valid, um, but they don't necessarily suggest the same inductive biases, or in other words, uh, the same architectural uh, features. Uh, and so I think this is a, a, a good ability to have to be able to navigate freely between these perspectives. Before I jump in with the definitions, let's think about some use cases. So one example I like to give when I introduce feature-wise transformations is the example of class conditional generative modeling. Um, so the best image generation models that we have today are class conditional, meaning that there's a distinct generation pipeline for each class in the data set. So in this example, we have three classes, cat, dog, and airplane. So we have a collection of cat pictures, a collection of dog pictures, a collection of airplane pictures. And then uh, we train our class conditional generative model by training separate generators, one for cats, trained exclusively on cat images, one for dogs, and so on and so on. And uh, to sample from the model conditioned on a class, well, we, we have some noise input, which we just need to feed to the right generator. So if we want to sample cat pictures, we route the noise to the cat generator. 
and then we get a cat picture as output. Okay, this is all good, but this is not how state-of-the-art models are built nowadays. So we don't have separate generation pipelines for each class in the data set. Uh, instead, we have a single generation pipeline that is supplied with a class indicator, um, in this case, cat, dog, or airplane. Uh, and that class indicator should influence the way in which the generator somehow processes the noise input and produces an output. Um, as a side note, there's nothing preventing us from packaging these three generators into one class conditional generator, which trivially routes the noise uh, to the right sub-generator uh, for conditioning. Okay, but it's, uh, and also it's, it's one of the many instances where I'll tell you in this lecture that if you squint your eyes, uh, your eyes hard enough, um, that concept A really is a special case of concept B. So um, we'll see more examples of that later. Um, but it's, it's questionable whether we gain anything uh, by doing this because the three generators don't share anything. So what have we gained really? And I see two immediate problems with that. One is uh, scaling. So here we have three classes. So we have three separate instances of the network architecture to train and store. Maybe that's good. Uh, but what if we scale up to ImageNet where we have a thousand classes? Do you really want to uh, train and store separate copies of a network architecture 1,000 times? Maybe not. Um, another problem is that of a lack of positive transfer. So what I mean by this is that, for instance, in ImageNet, there are many uh, dog breeds, so many classes of dogs. And if we were to train separate generators on each of them, we would have to learn to generate uh, fur texture uh, in all cases. So it seems kind of wasteful to be relearning that over and over again. And we'd also be losing on uh, tons of useful examples by keeping things siloed. It's still an, on, uh, it's, it's still an ongoing research question, um, how to construct model architectures that scale well and favor positive transfer. But as we'll see later, each OS transformations represent one kind of approach that is both simple and effective in that respect. Already here, I think we can see different perspectives emerge. So let's look at three of them. One is that of modality fusion. So uh, we can think of modality fusion as having multiple modalities, in this case, a noise input and a class label. And what we want to do is we want to fuse them somehow in such a way that we produce the right output. So we're solving a single task for which both the noise and the class label are inputs. From the multitask learning perspective, we tackle multiple tasks, one per class in parallel, in a parameter efficient ma uh, manner through parameter sharing. So uh, we have uh, one source of noise, which uh, can serve many different tasks and then we want to produce the right output. From the conditioning perspective, we are processing this noise input in the context of the class label. So the class label here is treated as a site information channel. Um, and there's an interesting asymmetry here, uh, which is that unlike with the modality fusion example, where we didn't have any preferred modality. Oh, question? Uh, considering the real science of the subject? Um, so, so your question is, do we, uh, is it considering the, the actual size of the objects that it is generating? Um, that's a good question. So there's, there's nothing that is explicitly enforcing that. It's only through um, observation that the generator learns to do that. So, so if, if statistically things have a certain scale with respect to each other, that's what the generator will learn, but there's nothing explicitly enforcing that to happen. Um, so back to, back to the notion of asymmetry. Uh, so we have a preferred modality here, which is the noise input. And then uh, the, the label, as I said, is treated as a site information channel. And it, it's also used to modulate the computation, as I was saying earlier. Okay, let's uh, switch over to a new example visual reasoning. So um, very briefly, what visual reasoning is, is that we have an image that we have uh, as input here, and we want to ask questions about that image, and questions that probe the model's ability to reason about the content and relationship uh, of objects between 
uh, between objects in, in the image. We can also think about this problem from the three different learning perspectives I just introduced. So from the modality fusion perspective, the uh, image modality and the text modality should be fused together in such a way that we get the right answer at the output. The conditioning perspective says that we're processing the input image in the context of the question being asked. Uh, so what I mean by this is that there's, there's one image as input, but we could ask many different questions about it. Uh, and our goal is to extract the right kind of information. So the, 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 the image needs to be processed in the context of that question. Uh, note here that we're not limited to a finite set of contexts, like the finite set of classes in our class conditional generative modeling example, um, because for any input image, there's an unbounded number of questions we could ask about that image. From the multitask learning perspective, um, one question amounts to one computational process. So what I mean by this is um, a question we could ask uh, could apply to any input image, assuming, of course, that the question makes sense for that input image. So uh, in a sense, a question can be thought of as a task description. So for example, the question, how many green cubes are there, uh, corresponds to the task of identifying and counting green cubes in an image. Um, a note here more generally about visual reasoning is that uh, it's not enough to do, well, to do well on the previous tasks that we've seen, so questions in the training set, uh, because to be useful, a visual reasoning model should be able to generalize to new questions. And there's no training data that exists for those questions. Um, we don't have a, a paired input and output. Um, and so there's a name for that problem. It's called zero-shot learning. And the reason why it could ever work is because we're exploiting similarities between tasks. So in this example here, the question, how many green cubes are there, is similar to the questions, how many blue cubes are there, and how many green spheres are there? Because it shares the shape of that question, and it shares the color with that question. So if the model is able to answer these two questions, then perhaps it's in a good position to answer that question here. Um, but to build a useful notion of task similarity, we need to build task representations. Uh, and a task representation allows us to project those task descriptions onto a space in which distances are indicative of similarity between tasks. So, this is a form of task representation learning, uh, as I would call it. And sometimes learning the representation for the task is a separate process, uh, but sometimes uh, it is also learned jointly, and mostly for the examples in this lecture, as we'll see, it, it is learned jointly with the rest of uh, the problem. Okay, so to summarize, I've introduced a few different complementary perspectives on some learning problems. And the common denom denominator for these perspectives is a requirement to combine different information sources. Um, and that goes beyond the usual input-output data processing paradigm of, for instance, supervised learning. So next, we'll examine one family of approaches to combining these different information sources, which uh, I call feature-wise transformations. And we'll examine how these different learning perspectives fit into the framework of feature-wise transformations. Okay, so what's a feature-wise transformation? In short, it's a transformation on an input feature vector or a stack of feature maps that acts independently on individual features or feature maps. So I'll, I'll get to the feature map and convolutional case uh, in just the next slide. But for now, let's concentrate on the vector case. So what I mean by that is um, that we have an input, which is a vector, and then we have, uh, for instance, we could, we could bias it, so we have a biasing vector, and then uh, the operation is applied element-wise on, on each feature. So we're not recombining those features, we're not taking weighted sums of those features, we're, uh, for instance, biasing them individually or scaling them individually. We could also be gating them, so if, if the scaling is restricted to be between zero and one, we have a sort of a soft on-off Kind of semantic, uh, so that could be achieved by uh, passing our, our scaling vector through a sigmoidal activation function, for instance. Um, and we can generalize all of these 
three examples into a notion of feature-wise affine transformation. So in, in a visual reasoning paper I co-authored, we proposed the name film for feature-wise linear modulation. Um, for those of you who are a bit more math oriented, I, I know that technically uh, a linear transformation is not the same as an affine transformation, but uh, we couldn't resist having a nice acronym, so please excuse us for that. Um, Okay, and, and feature-wise transformations are, are used quite a lot, as you'll see, so it's kind of useful to have a catch-all term to reason about them. So something that is uh, either scaling, shifting, gating, uh, anything of that nature. So in this lecture, we'll use the film nomenclature. Uh, and the reason for that is because I think it's a useful communication tool. As I said, it's a catch-all term. It allows us to reason more abstractly about these concepts. Uh, but please don't take this as me claiming technical innovation on all of these methods that I'll be discussing. Because many papers out there, uh, some of which predate the film nomenclature, uh, make use of feature-wise transformations. So it's more of an observation on the, uh, the fact that these sorts of approaches are pretty ubiquitous. Um, depending on the restrictions that we impose on, on these film parameters, so, so the, the scaling and shifting coefficients, we, we recover uh, different flavors. So if, if there are no restrictions, we, we recover just film. Um, if the, the scaling is forced to be one, we recover biasing. If the biasing is forced to be zero, we, we recover scaling. And then, as I said earlier, if we restrict, restrict the, the scaling to be between zero and one, we get gating. So here's an example uh, animation showing how this works. Uh, so we have an, an input vector, and then we can control the value of the scaling and shifting coefficients. And you see that they only affect one feature here. So this is why we call this feature-wise transformations. Okay, so in, in the convolutional case that I, I brushed aside earlier, um, the, the way this works is that we still have uh, one scalar, but one scalar now per feature map. And, and the, the reason for that in short is because you can think of, of, of the convolution operation as, as convolving a feature detector over different spatial positions. So, so in essence, a feature map represents the same feature, but evaluated at different spatial positions. So from that perspective, it sort of makes sense that we would want to uh, uh, scale and shift entire feature maps rather than uh, different spatial positions. But there are papers out there that untie this scaling and shifting to different spatial positions. And there are uh, situations in which that makes sense. So uh, it's more of a, a rule to be broken than just a, a statement about all of these methods. Um, all right. So we introduce feature-wise transformations to the model by inserting film layers, so these, these things here that I, I showed in just the last slide, uh, into an existing network architecture. Um, so everything's trained jointly. It's just we update the network architecture by inserting these film, film layers. Um, and uh, we'll call uh, the scaling and shifting uh, coefficients here the film parameters in our nomenclature. Uh, and to reiterate, film layers here are an abstraction. So they can mean either of feature-wise affine, biasing, scaling, or gating transformations. Let's make this concrete. So let's revisit the class conditional generative modeling example. So the feature-wise transformation approach to uh, building a class conditional model here would be to start with an unconditional model uh, and then um, turn it into a, a class conditional model. So just a reminder of the problem, why we want to do this is because if we are to learn separate generators for each class in the data set, uh, we have an explosion in the number of trainable parameters, and we want to avoid that. Um, so, as I said earlier, we take a base generator architecture, we insert film layers throughout the architecture, uh, and then uh, we learn separate sets of film parameters for each class. So we have a cat set of film parameters, we have a dog set of film parameters, an airplane set of film parameters. And then the way in which we condition the model is that we have our noises input. And then if I condition, say, on the category, category cat, I will take the cat film parameters, use them inside of the network, and then feed in the noise, get the cat as output. OK, let's squint our eyes again. Um, there are different ways of explaining what we're doing here. One interpretation is that this is a fancy and compact way of describing several class-specific generators, which just, which just happen 
to share most of their parameters. So in other words, uh, we have different generators here that are not explicitly represented, but we can think of them implicitly. And so they share all of these parameters here and uh, they, they specialize these sets of parameters uh, in the network. And so uh, what's really going on when we're conditioning is that we're implicitly swapping out class specific generators. So that's one interpretation. Another interpretation is that this is a special kind of a hyper network. So for those of you who don't know what a hyper network is, it's a network which predicts the parameters for another network. So uh, what's going on here really is that we're, we're taking the cat class, we're, we're feeding it through our hyper network, which will predict the value for the film parameters, and then we can feed in the noise and get the output uh, as a result. So let's make this even clearer by uh, revisiting the visual reasoning example. So um, one way to use feature-wise transformations for this is to start with a convolutional network. So we're still trying to map an input to perhaps a, a distribution over possible answers. Um, and uh, like with the class conditional generator, we'll insert film layers throughout the architecture. Um, but here, instead of learning a separate set of film parameters per class, because uh, as a reminder, there's an unbounded number of questions we can ask. So we can't really learn a separate set of film parameters for each. Uh, we'll, we'll learn a mapping from the question itself to the value of the film parameters. So here I could use, for example, a recurrent neural, neural network to map the, the, the question to the value of the film parameters. Um, and just as a side note, this is far from the only approach to visual reasoning out there. Um, there are some approaches that incorporate additional in inductive biases, such as a notion of, of modularity in the visual pipeline, like I want to be composing explicit blocks of computation, or, or they can also incorporate a notion of relation between objects. So this is, this is not the only way to uh, solve the problem, but it is a way which doesn't have a lot of inductive biases baked into it. Okay, uh, let's move away from problem specific details and consider an abstraction that fits both the class conditional generative modeling problem and the visual reasoning problem. So in both cases, we have two components to the model architecture. Uh, we have a, a task solving network being modulated, which we'll call the filmed network. And we have an auxiliary network, which maps a task description to a set of modulation parameters, which we'll call the, the, the film generator here. So the film generator can be really simple or complex. In the class conditional generative modeling example, we saw that uh, it was just selecting parameters. So you can think of this as uh, we're building a big matrix of film parameters. The rows represent different classes and the columns represent different scaling and shifting coefficients for different features or feature maps. And so the film generator really is just selecting a row in that matrix and using the parameter values inside of the network. Um, the generator can also be more complicated, such as in the visual reasoning example, um, where uh, we have an explicit mapping from a question to uh, parameter values. Okay, so if you're still thinking about the different learning perspectives I introduced earlier, uh, you may have recognized that this is leaning more towards the conditioning perspective than the modality fusion perspective, uh, because there's a clear asymmetry in how we handle the two modalities. And this suggests a different kind of inductive bias. So one, modular, uh, one, one modality is, is influencing how another one is being processed, as opposed to the two modalities being processed in parallel for some time and then aggregated for further processing. As we continue in the lecture, I'll become less and less perspective agnostic uh, and rely more heavily on the conditioning perspective. And the reason for that is because I think there are interesting observations and insights to explore here, but keep in mind that there's merit to all perspectives. And sometimes the modality fusion perspective is more suitable. So for instance, what happens if we have three modalities which we wanna to combine together? How would we use uh, the, the film framework for that? Uh, not clear. Or what happens if I have two modalities, for instance, uh, uh, audio and video in, in a video clip, uh, which don't have a clear conditioning relationship. Once again, it's, it's a bit harder to uh, think about this from the conditioning perspective. Okay. At this point, I think it would be useful to, over, to go over a few example applications. 
And, and the goal here is to help you recognize applications of feature-wise transformations in the literature. And as you'll see, they come with many different names, so it's good to be able to uh, connect them back to a more general framework. And I also want to get you to draw parallels with your own problems. Perhaps you'll recognize something useful uh, for you. Um, and as such, I'll be focusing on, on showing different aspects of feature-wise transformations. So I won't be necessarily thorough in citing all of the relevant literature. Um, I won't be doing justice to the full history of application of, of uh, feature-wise transformations. Um, and in the distal article, we also have this, uh, this sort of recency bias, but we do have bibliographic notes that attempt to be a bit more thorough. Um, in pointing to uh, older related work. So if you're curious about that, I would encourage you to uh, check out the Dissel article. Okay, let's start with a straightforward one. Uh, so this is the visual reasoning example I, I, I gave earlier, and, and this is the paper in which we proposed the film nomenclature. Um, and so uh, there's not much else to say about this. So in, in this specific case, we're inserting film layers in the residual blocks of the network. But aside from that, I think you, you, get, the, you get the picture. Um, Feature-wise transformations have also been applied to style transfer. And we'll see three examples of that. So small primer on style transfer, uh, if you're not familiar. So some approaches uh, to style transfer train a feed for network that is specialized to a single style image. So the idea here is I have a style image, I have a content image, uh, I wanna produce a pastiche, a, a stylized version of the content image in the style of this image. Uh, how do I do that? Well, I, I specialize my network, I, I fix the style image, I specialize my network to, to that style image, and then I train a network which is able to turn any input content image into its pastiche of that specific style. The, the loss formulation is unimportant for this discussion, so just know that there's a way uh, to provide a training signal that encourages that. Um, and here we're also faced with an explosion in parameters because uh, if I train a special network for each style image and I wanna build a, a, a system that is a collection of different style images, uh, well, I need to train separate networks for each, uh, each style image. Uh, so again, the naive approach uh, that trains one network per style image in the system leads to an explosion in the number of parameters that we need to train. Um, and so again, the, the feature-wise transformation solution to that is to turn the network into a style conditional version of itself by inserting film layers in the network architecture. Okay, so let's examine these three examples. Um, the first example is a paper I authored where uh, we were considering a setting in which we have a finite collection of style images. Um, so this is very similar to the class conditional generative modeling example, but instead of having classes to, to model, we have different styles to model. Uh, and and the, the intuition behind that work really was that we, we wanted somehow to compress these many different models into one style conditional model. We wanted to be more parameter efficient. Um, and the way in which we do the conditioning is by specializing instance normalization layers in the network to each style. So small note on, uh, on that, um, normalization layers are a natural location to use feature-wise transformations because, um, so just small reminder on, on, on normalization layers. So you, you take your input uh, feature vector or stack of feature maps, you normalize it uh, with respect to the, the whole batch or, or spatial axes or whichever variant you want. And then you have a scaling and a shifting operation afterwards to, to control. So the features are, are centered, they're standardized, but now you can rescale them, you can shift them. Uh, so we already have in normalization layers these sorts of feature-wise scaling and shifting. So it's a natural place to be putting in these film layers. Um, so in this paper, we call this conditional instance normalization. So you can think of this as we're swapping out instance normalization layer parameter values depending on the style that we're using. And um, yep, that's, that's, essentially, that's essentially it about that, that method. Um, okay, so we, we can extend that pretty naturally to uh, the zero shot setting. So say I have a new style image, my, my system wasn't trained on it, I'd like to be able to do well on that. Uh, well, as we've seen with the, the visual reasoning example, um, we can do so by predicting film parameter values from the task description. So in this case, our task description is the style image, 
uh, well, why not introduce a mapping from style image to film parameter values? So this is what was done in this paper. Um, and um, so briefly, uh, the way this works is that we have our input content image that we'd like to stylize. We have our style image, and then we, uh, we pass it through the film generator, predict a set of film parameters to be used in the main style transfer network, and then we feed in the content image, and then we get the output. Um, and this is a, a small animation here to show you what happens if you feed in style images that have not been seen during training. Uh, and as you can see, the model does a pretty good job at zero strut generalization in this case. Another related example that you might see cited in other papers uh, is ADA in for adaptive instance normalization. So this is yet another name, but the principle stays the same. We specialize instance normalization parameter values to different style images. Um, and it also allows zero shot generalization. What I think is interesting in this work is uh, the way in which the film generator is constructed. So in, in the previous work, we had a, an explicit mapping from style image to the value of the film parameters. Here, what's happening is that we feed both the content and the style image through some encoder uh, that is shared between the two. And then uh, when we want to perform instance normalization, we normalize the content stack of feature maps. Uh, and then we scale it in shifting according to statistics collected from the style stack of feature maps. And, and that is sufficient in their case to allow zero shot generalization. So. Um, if you squint your eyes again, the film generator is, is a heuristic that reuses the encoder network and, and performs a fixed processing on the style stack of feature maps. So this is just to say that um, there are many ways in which you could uh, design this film generator. OK, this problem setting should be familiar to you. We're talking about class conditional generative modeling. Um, has Emily discussed Big GAN yesterday? Maybe, maybe not. Yes, I, I have a yes, good. So I, I won't spend too much time uh, talking about it again. Uh, this is a, a pretty impressive model that came out recently. Uh, and it uses conditional batch normalization uh, for class conditioning, which you'll recognize as an application of feature-wise transformations. Uh, it also incorporates a twist on how the generator uses the input noise. So uh, a low dimensional embedding is learned for each class. And then the, the, the way in which we predict the film parameters is that uh, so first, we take the noise vector as input, and we chunk it into different, different chunks. So this is what's seen here. So we take z as input, we split it into different chunks, which are, are fed here. Uh, and then we concatenate the noise chunk to the class embedding, and then we linearly project that into uh, film parameter values. Um, so one way to see this is uh, that noise is being injected at multiple locations in the generation process. Another way to see this is that we have noisy film parameter values. Um, and, and that, it, as you can see on the right, uh, allows to generate uh, pretty convincing images. Of course, this is not the only ingredient in there that makes it work. They scaled the architecture up by, by quite a lot, scaled up the batch size as well. But, uh, but uh, feature-wise transformations are at the core of the class conditioning mechanism in this work. OK, let's travel back to the ancient times of 2015, 2016, which by deep learning years is really, really old, apparently. Um, so DC GAN is perhaps the most cited GAN paper after the original GAN paper, uh, because it introduced a convolutional architecture that uh, worked much, much better than uh, the fully connected architecture in the original GAN paper. Um, and they condition on the class by concatenating the class label to stacks of feature maps in the network. So it's a slightly different mechanism. They, they do conditioning by concatenation rather than by biasing. But the reason why I point out this paper to you is because there's an equivalence between concatenation-based conditioning and, and conditional biasing. Um, and the reason why, so think of, think of this example here. Um, so we have our input here, and we have the conditioning signal here. We concatenate them together. We multiply that with a matrix. Um, you can always decompose the matrix vector product into two smaller products, uh, one with just the, uh, the, the input and one with just the conditioning signal. And uh, afterwards, you add 
the, these two resulting vectors element-wise. And what you can recognize here is that uh, you can think of this as a conditioning bias. So really, uh, concatenation and biasing are essentially the same from that point of view. Uh, while, while we're on the topic of GANs, here's another recent architecture which made quite a splash. Uh, it's called style GAN, and uh, those are actual model samples. Not, they're not real pictures of faces, so it, it, it uh, did uh, very well on that task. Uh, and one of the central principles here is that the input noise vector is, isn't even fed as input to the generator. So uh, instead, we learn a, a, uh, a fixed constant to serve as the input of the generator. And the way in which the noise vector intervenes is purely by predicting the value of film parameters to be used in these adaptive instance normalization layers, uh, which we've seen earlier. Um, so uh, so that, that, that is another twist on how to use feature-wise transformations, and, and they, they even remove the input from the generator in that case. OK, so switch, let's switch gears a little. Here's another cool idea. So say that you want to deploy a model on devices that have different amounts of, uh, of processing power. Um, you could train separate networks with different widths, for, for example, uh, to have different uh, kind of uh, computational ex uh, expenses, if you will, um, one for each uh, desired level of computational effort. Um, but as we discussed in the context of class conditional generative modeling, this is wasteful. Um, and so instead, it, we, it would be better to train a single network and use only the neurons up to a certain width in, in the network. Uh, so you can deploy only one model, and then you can select the width that you want to use that corresponds to the computational effort you want to make. Uh, it turns out that by specializing batch normalization layers to each target width, which they call switchable batch normalization in the paper, uh, you can do just that. So the idea is that uh, we learn, so there are batch normalization layers in this model architecture, and then we'll learn different sets of parameters uh, for each width. Um, and it turns out that you can get good, uh, good accuracy and computational effort trade-offs, and you can, you can select the width at, uh, at deployment time. So I think that uh, example illustrates really well the concept of compressing many models into one using feature-wise transformations. Um, okay, so far we've only covered image synthesis applications. Um, but feature-wise transformations are also used in other research areas. So here's a reinforcement learning example. And the goal here is to do instruction following. So uh, we have an agent here, which is navigating in, in a doom-like environment. Um, and we have an instruction. Uh, and we expect the agent to uh, carry out that instruction. Um, and the instruction is in natural language. So in this example, the way in which the policy network is conditioned is that uh, we predict feature-wise gating parameters from the instruction. So we have the instruction as input, we process it, and then we, we predict uh, gating parameters to be applied to the output of the visual pipeline part of the policy. And uh, in that uh, paper, uh, it is sufficient to be able to do instruction following. Here we have a language model where uh, one half of the feature vectors is used to predict how to gate the other half. So in, in, in this uh, diagram, uh, it's, it's right here. So uh, we, we predict uh, feature vectors at every time step. And then uh, we take one half, uh, this half here, yep. And then uh, we pass it through a sigmoidal nonlinearity. And then we multiply it element-wise with the other half. Um, so the motivation in this paper has more to do with avoiding gradient vanishing than it has to do with using feature-wise transformations. But I think it's, it's illustrative of another interesting concept here, which is that of self-modulation. So in the examples I gave previously, the conditioning signal was always external, or it was a site information channel. But there's nothing that says that this conditioning signal has to come from an auxiliary information source. It could very well be coming from another part of the network, as in this example, and uh, we'll see other examples of that. So here's another example. Um, 
So this is the submission that won the first place in the ImageNet 2017 challenge. And uh, one of the central ideas in the model architecture is uh, that they have a pathway branching off uh, from the main pathway and that is predicting feature-wise scaling parameters to be, to be applied onto the main pathway. Uh, and, and that architectural feature, uh, along with the other improvements suggested in the, in the paper, uh, uh, helped win this ImageNet 2017 uh, competition. Okay, so um, somewhat related to self-modulation is the idea of adapting to changes in the input distribution. So uh, here's an example illustrating that. Um, here we have a speech recognition model uh, and we, uh, we want it to be robust to different speakers and to different noise conditions. And so the way in which this model does it, it that it first builds a representation of the full utterance uh, and then it uses that to predict layer normalization parameter values um, to be used uh, inside of the uh, layer, layer normalization layers. Um, they call that dynamic layer normalization in this paper, but again, it's an instance of uh, feature-wise transformation. And um, here's another example of that. So the, this notion of adapting to different input distributions uh, using feature-wise transformations, uh, we also find it in uh, few shot image classification. So very briefly, what is few shot image classification? So few shot learning aims to learn from uh, very few labeled examples. So we, we seek to mimic the, the human ability to learn from just a, a few examples. Uh, and to simulate that in few shot learning, we build what's called learning episodes where we have a learner that sees a, a new a uh, small training set for a new learning problem and is expected to perform well on a held out set of examples. Uh, and so we, the, 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 the actual training loss is not how well the, the learner is doing on the training set, it's how well it's doing at generalizing on a test set. Um, and there are many, many learning episodes like this which are formed artificially uh, in order to encourage that. And we optimize the whole process, uh, again, such that when you train on the small training set, you generalize well on the hell out set. And in this paper, uh, oh yeah, and, and one of the problems that you can have with this is maybe the learner sees a, a completely new input distribution. So images, for instance, that unlike it has seen before, so uh, different statistics. And in this paper, uh, they propose the idea of first predicting film parameters value, pr parameter values from the training set. Uh, and then to use those film parameter values inside the main learner uh, in order to be more robust to changes in input distributions. Okay. Okay, so hopefully these examples gave you a good taste of the variety of settings in which feature-wise transformations uh, are applied. Now I'd like to focus on interesting properties of feature-wise transformations themselves. And I'll start with a disclaimer. Some of the interpretations that I'll be making in this part of the lecture are more speculative than factual by nature. So please do uh, exercise critical thinking in assessing what I'm saying here. Okay, one interesting consequence of film is that we end up predicting a low dimensional vector of film parameters. Uh, and so to give you an example, in the style transfer model, uh, I was working on the, the, the number of film parameters accounted for about 0.2% of the total parameter count in the, in the whole model. Um, so that's not a lot of parameters to be modulating to have such a drastic effect on the computational properties of the model. Um, so squinting our eyes again, there's at least two possible interpretations to this. One from the computational perspective is that um, film parameters are an instruction on how to modulate computation in a task solving network. Another interpretation from the representation learning perspective is that film parameters are a representation of the task description. So let's focus on the representation learning perspective for an instant. Um, so assume we can extract the representation from our task descriptions. What can we do with that representation? 
So if you recall the style transfer example, the common, the, the common denominator was that we uh, associate film parameters to individual style images. So you can, if you, if you think of the style image as a stylization task, then the film parameters are a bit like its style representation. Now, my background is in generative modeling, and we have a cliche, which is that we love to do interpolations in latent space. Uh, so uh, we love to interpolate vectors in latent space and see things very smoothly in pixel space. Uh, and this is a bit like when the neural networks community was fixated on showing weight filters for a while. Um, so we, we have that cliche, I guess. Um, and of course, when I was working on style transfer, I had to interpolate film parameters. So here's what's going on in this animation. So each individual image on the left corresponds to a different style that the model was trained on. And to the right here, we have the feed of a, a, a camera, video feed of a camera that is being fed through the style transfer network frame by frame. And then we're using the film parameters uh, that, uh, and I'll describe how we get them afterwards and to stylize this image. And so how do we get these film parameters? Well, we can take a convex combination of different uh, film parameters associated to different style images. And what you see when uh, we're doing that is that we're varying the style smoothly. So we're transitioning smoothly from one style to another. Um, there's a pretty clear use case in this example. Um, it's a more natural way of interacting with the model. It, it allows users to uh, blend styles together to express their creativity. But I think that at a, more, uh, at a more abstract level, what we can conclude from that is that interpolating between task rep representations leads to meaningful changes to the task solving network's computational properties. So this is not a property that should hold in all use cases, but in this instance, it does. And it also does in this example. So uh, this is big GAN again. Uh, and as a reminder, this is a class conditional generative model. We're, we're conditioning via uh, film layers inserted throughout the architecture. And um, so the, and the film parameters are predict predicted linearly from the concatenation of the input noise and a learned class embedding. A consequence of doing things that way is that we now have a class representation for each class and we can think of interpolating between these class representations. Uh, so we can probe what's in between categories by taking linear interpolations of class embeddings. And once again, you see smooth transitions. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the old Animorphs TV show for those of you who know what I'm talking about. Um, and what's interesting here as well is that the, the pose remains roughly the same in those examples, which maybe suggests that there's a, a nice separation between what's encoded by the input noise and what's encoded by the class embeddings. So this ability to interpolate between tasks ties in nicely with the broader theme of what meaning to assign to hidden layers in a neural network. As you've probably been told, one interpretation is that a hidden layer is an abstract representation of the input. Uh, but an alternative interpretation, which I first heard from Ian Goodfellow, but uh, almost certainly it's been put forward by others, uh, is that hidden layers amount to intermediate stages uh, in a numerical program. So what this suggests to me is that feature-wise transformations may be a mechanism through which a model learns and composes computational primitives. Um, and this interpretation is closer to the computational perspective than the representation learning perspective. Uh, but as, as you've noticed by now, uh, moving freely between interpretations is more or less a theme of its own in this lecture. So I think this is a good thing. Um, okay, beyond interpolations, another operation that the deep learning community loves to apply to representations is analogies. So um, here we have uh, the classical word2vec example. So uh, in word2vec, we learn an embedding for words in a vocabulary, and then uh, we perform analogies. So the classical example is king minus man plus woman plus queen. And so if we take the uh, word embedding for the word king, subtract the one for the word man, add the one for the word woman, lo and behold, we get uh, the embedding for the word queen. Uh, Terms and conditions apply. You have to exclude uh, the, the, the query words here for that to work, uh, but you get the idea. 
So in our visual reasoning work, we were curious to see if that property also held for the learned task representations. So um, in this example, the question is, what is the blue big cylinder made of? And so the usual way of operating the model is that we feed the question uh, through the film generator, we use the output film parameters in the task solving network and um, we feed in an input image, we get a predicted answer as output. In this case, rubber, which is not the right answer, it should be metal. Um, and perhaps this is because the question involves concepts that have, have been seen in training, uh, but in isolation, never together before, so the model doesn't really know what to do with, it, with the, that new question. Uh, but in any case, uh, what happens here is that the model fails to generalize to a new question. So taking inspiration from the word 2 examples, an alternative way of operating the model is to express this question here as a combination of three questions that have been seen during training. Um, so the question, what is the blue big cylinder made of, can be thought of as uh, what is the blue big sphere made of, plus what is the green big cylinder made of minus what is the green big sphere made of. Uh, so in, in, on one hand, you have blue plus green minus, greens, uh, minus green, so blue. And on the other hand, you have sphere plus cylinder minus sphere, so you have cylinder. So we symbolically recover the, the, the question. Um, so first, we feed all these three questions through the film generator. Then we combine their film parameters in the same way. And it turns out that this works for visual reasoning uh, or for, for the visual reasoning model we were studying. Uh, not always, but it still corrected a non-negligible amount of errors that the model was making. So I think this is an interesting observation on its own, but it also raises interesting questions about failure modes uh, for this type of architecture, uh, more generally the, the, the film uh, sort of framework. Um, so knowing that we can recover the right answer through algebraic manipulations, um, of film parameters. When a model makes a mistake, is it because it lacks computational primitives to solve the task, or is it because it failed to combine them appropriately? And I think there's, uh, there's an important lesson to, to be learned here, which is that like before networks can overfit on the training set, task conditional networks can overfit on the training set of tasks. Uh, and overfitting was in fact one of the major challenges in, in this work. Um, and uh, reducing overfitting uh, required being very careful in choosing the capacity of the film generator. So if, if you're ever working with these types of architectures, know that there are many sources of overfitting and, and know that you can target different parts of the architecture to combat that. Um, another lesson to be learned. Oh, yes. I, so so I, it's a good question. I think if you're, if you're primed on the problem, you could probably answer that question correctly. So here the, the, the rubber objects are never shiny. So they're, they're matte. And so, uh, so this is a way in which, um, so this is, this is an artificially constructed setting. I, I'd say this specific data set, Clever, was, was built because it was observed that in visual reasoning, um, the models turned, uh, tended to uh, rely on biases in the data set rather than on actual reasoning capabilities. So if I ask you, uh, if, if you see a green pasture and I ask you, what is the animal? You probably think oh, this is a cow. And this is exactly what the model was, the models were doing. They were not answering based on the content of the image, but just based on the statistical similarities. So uh, the, the goal for that specific data set was to reduce these sorts of biases that the, that the model could rely on. Now, is it, is it, a, um, uh, is it a, a fair task to be achieved by humans? I, I think humans were scoring pretty well uh, when they were evaluated on that. Uh, I'd have to look again. Uh, maybe it's that specific example that is, that is confusing, but generally uh, we're pretty good uh, for that data set as well. Okay, cool. Thank, thank you for your question. Um, so the, the other lesson, so Again, uh, getting back into, into the context, so why are we making, making mistakes and, and what lessons this can, can tell us? Um, so another lesson is that the film point of view, I think, uh, highlights a separation between the various computational primitives that are learned by the film network. Uh, so these are the, the computational primitives, if you will, and the numerical res uh, recipes that we learn 
uh, through the film generator and how to combine those uh, computational primitives. So the model's ability to generalize depends on both uh, its ability to parse new forms of task descriptions, but also on having learned the required computational primitives to solve those tasks. Okay, um, I'd like to conclude this lecture by uh, discussing notions of interpretability. Um, I'm by no means an expert on the topic, um, and luckily you'll get to hear from an actual expert on the topic right after the break. Um, but I couldn't pass on the opportunity to discuss what sort of interpretations we can make in the context of feature-wise transformations. So when I was playing with um, conditional instance normalization in the, the, the style transfer work, one of the things that surprised me very much is uh, that despite their simplicity, feature-wise transformations are very effective at modulating the computation in the network. Uh, again, 0.2% of the total parameter count that we're varying, that is sufficient to cause drastic changes in the computational properties of the style transfer network. Um, and it's been, I, this is the hammer I've been hitting every nail with uh, ever since. And uh, um, it's, it's been pretty effective in many different problem settings. Um, so to me, this raises the question, how can so few simple interactions compound into meaningful modulations of the task solving network? And this is something which uh, I've always wanted to explain. So let's speculate a little. Um, with what we've been discussing so far regarding learning and composing computational primitives, one hypothesis that we could make is that feature-wise transformations are a sort of a selection mechanism for those uh, primitives. Um, so for instance, uh, we could think of feature-wise transformations as a mechanism for shutting off features or feature maps. And, and why would that be a selection mechanism? Well, um, if you take a feature and you zero it out, it's as if you had never computed it uh, in the first place. So you could do it by setting the scaling to zero and, and the biasing to zero as well. Uh, you could do it by using a very negative bias. So if, if, you're, if your operation is followed by some nonlinearity, which uh, zeroes out things that are negative, like uh, uh, rectified linear unit, for instance, uh, that, could be, that could be used. Um, so maybe there is a mechanism like that at play here. Um, and it sounds like a wonderful interpretation, but in practice, it doesn't hold. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have fancy plots to show for that, but here's what I can tell. So for the distal article, we looked into style transfer and uh, visual reasoning models. Um, the, so the, the one for which the, the, we were uh, predicting film parameter values from the style image and the visual reasoning uh, model I was presenting in, as the first example uh, in the example section. Uh, and both of them use uh, affine variants of film. And we looked for evidence in favor of this selection mechanism hypothesis. So one of the things we would expect to see if we're selecting features uh, left and right is uh, that applying film should lead to a non-negligible amount of feature maps that are turned off. Um, however, when we measure the sparsity, we found it to be very low. I think it's at most 10% of the feature maps uh, that were completely off at any given time. And in instances where the feature maps were turned off, we weren't able to identify a unique mechanism which would explain why they were turned off. Uh, so things were a bit all over the place. So sadly, the conclusion uh, we, we drew from this is that there's no supporting evidence for the selection mechanism hypothesis, and there's apparently no unique mechanism by which film can turn off features or feature maps. Um, I wouldn't completely rule out uh, a modified, that a modified version of the hypothesis could offer an explanation. Um, and also keep in mind that the number of models we examine is uh, extremely small. We're talking about two models which use the affine variant. So there's tons of things to explore here, but to this day, I don't think we have a good explanation for how feature-wise transformations are somehow able to compound into meaningful modulations of the task solving network. The consolation is that there are some interesting things we can say about the way in which film parameters cluster across task descriptions. Um, and even though this has not yielded uh, a lot of insights yet into how film operates at a computational level, I think this has the potential to help interpret the purpose of different parts of the task solving network. So let's take a closer look at that. 
Um, what you see here is uh, scatter plots of film parameters. Uh, so this is for the visual reasoning model. This is for the style transfer model. The x axis corresponds to the scaling coefficient. The y axis corresponds to the shifting coefficient. Uh, and then each point corresponds to a different uh, task description. So here it's a different question. Here it's a different style image. And then uh, also a, a, a different feature map. So to help visualize things, we color coded things by feature map. So uh, all points of a certain color would correspond to uh, different questions uh, and their uh, associated film parameter values for a specific uh, feature map. Okay. Um, so mar marginally across all feature maps, this is a big mess. Um, there's not a lot of structure, but however, uh, if, if, we, um, if we look at individual feature maps, so individual colors here, uh, we see that there's a fairly simple structure. So for, for most feature maps in both models, the points tend to cluster in, into a single dense blob. And for the visual reasoning model, they occasionally form more than one mode. So uh, let's wait until we find one. So this one, uh, this one. So there are a few examples like that that we can see. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll expand more on that later. So thinking back about style interpolations, maybe this explains why they don't produce garbage results. Because any convex combination of film parameters is likely to correspond to a meaningful parameterization of the task solving network. So the network kind of knows what to do with that. So that's, that's reassuring. Um, also, looking at the axis alignment of those different blobs, we see that some clusters tend to vary across the scaling axis, like in this example, or some others tend to vary across the biasing axis, and some tend to be diagonally aligned. So my interpretation of this is that the model has learned to modulate feature maps in various ways, sometimes via scaling, sometimes via biasing, and sometimes using a combination of both. So perhaps when we were looking for a, a unique mechanism, uh, that explained how film modulates, um, it was a bit pointless. There are many mechanisms. Um, also keep in mind this is for affine transformations. I'm sure there are other interpretations to make in the case of uh, uh, gating, for instance, or other types of mechanisms. Okay, so th those film parameter scatter plots hint at the fact that the way in which film parameters are structured across tasks varies depending on the problem setting. So this is what I was hinting at earlier when I said that uh, for the visual reasoning example, we see more than, than one mode, which uh, we're not observing in, in the case of the style transfer uh, example. So this means that perhaps we shouldn't expect to find a unique and problem independent explanation for the success of feature-wise transformations. Um, but uh, still, there are some interesting things we can say when we look at this individual problem. So uh, I, I sh I'm showing you two cherry-picked examples uh, of, of these uh, multimodal blobs um, that we found in the visual reasoning model. Uh, and in, in the Distill article, we hypothesized that maybe this is the, the compositional and discrete nature of visual reasoning that, that requires these different well-defined modes of operation that are not necessarily as much required in the style transfer example. Um, so moving forward, we can try to infer how questions regroup in, uh, into different feature maps. So here we color coded uh, the scatter plot by question type. So this is one feature map, this is another feature map. And then, um, so this question type information was, uh, is metadata that is available in the Clever data set that was used to train this model, but the model wasn't fed this information. This is just post hoc analysis. Uh, and what we see here is that sometimes there's a clear pattern that emerges, uh, like in this right plot here. So um, if you look at um, color, related, color related question types, they tend to be found in the top right cluster. So let's see, uh, equal color. Um, and then Let's loop back. So query color as well. So sometimes there's a pattern like that. Um, what's behind it? Good question. Uh, but it, it gives us some clues. Um, sometimes it's harder to draw a conclusion as with the left plot. So things seem to be just all over the place um, with no clear structure. 
So in that case, we can uh, turn to question content itself. So what we did here, uh, so this is the same plot as this plot here, and then we just switched over to a new feature map for uh, illustration purposes uh, on the right here. Um, okay, so uh, what's happening here is that we're just putting more focus on questions that contain uh, these words, so metallic, shiny, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, so let's look at the left plot, uh, especially when we hover around, uh, over the words front and behind. So uh, in the left plot, things uh, tend to distribute fairly uniformly across uh, uh, clusters, except for front and behind, where we seem to have uh, a bias towards the left or the right cluster. Um, I can't tell exactly what's going on again in that feature map, but it does look like something different happens when we're conditioning on questions relating to relative depths in the scene. Um, so is it possible that the computation it carries out somehow pertains to that notion of relative depth? Uh, I think that could be an interesting thing to, uh, to investigate. Um, now, if you, we look at the right plot, when I, over, uh, I hover over material related words, so material, uh, or rubber, matte, and then metal, metallic, and shiny. So you see that there's, again, some kind of left-right bias, depending on uh, whether um, we're talking about matte and rubber-like material or, or shiny or metallic-related material. By the way, these plots can all be interacted with in the distal article, in case you're curious. And you can also hover over points in the distal article to see what the questions are. So the, the examples I showed are, are a bit cherry-picked for clarity, but in truth, we didn't search for them very hard before we found them. This, this sort of, uh, uh, these sorts of patterns have, tend to happen all over the place. Um, so again, looking at, at scatter plots doesn't even come close to fully explaining what's going on. Uh, but it's, I think it's raising interesting questions that could be followed up on. Uh, taking a step back, uh, so given that both the style transfer and the visual reasoning examples seem to exhibit a lot of structure in the way in which film parameters cluster, um, we can think of doing uh, 2D projections to uh, try and see how questions cluster on, on the 2D plane. So for the, the still article, we used a technique called TSNE. I, I won't go into too many details uh, about TSNE itself. Um, just know that it's a projection technique that tends to maintain uh, structure uh, between, between points. Uh, and if, if you're curious to know more, know more about TSNE itself, you can have a look at the distill article on TSNE. Uh, I think this is a great resource on, on how to use it well. So here's the TSNE projection of film parameters for the visual reasoning model. Once again, each point corresponds to a different question and we color coded by question type. So overall questions tend to cluster fairly well by question type. Um, Sometimes you have some isolated clusters that look a bit weird. So uh, if you look at exists uh, right here, it clusters um, with equal color, okay? Uh, and so this doesn't appear to make that much sense at first glance, but then if you look at what are the questions in here, uh, these are questions about the existence of objects that have the same colors. It's a combination of both of these concepts, so it's kind of reassuring to see uh, that things tend to, 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 to make sense. Um, if we're looking at the TSNE projections for uh, our style transfer network example, uh, again, each point corresponds to a different style image. We color code by uh, painter. Uh, and things don't cluster as nicely, but maybe this is to be expected. Uh, again, uh, style transfer as a problem is perhaps less compositional than visual reasoning. Um, and so I have a fun anecdote to share about this. Uh, so when we were running the TSNE uh, projections, we did many, many runs. And uh, one of the clusters that was especially uh, robust to different runs was this one here. Um, which, if, if you look at the, the painters that are grouped together, doesn't seem to be making a lot of sense. So uh, I hope I'm not butchering his name, but Shishkin and, and Rembrandt um, are clustered together. And you, if you look at their paintings, um, they don't look very much the same. So I, I, my knowledge of art history is pretty embarrassing, but I do know how to Google. So I'm proud to tell you that I learned 
that day that Rembrandt is well known for his portraits, among other things, and that Shishkin was especially good at forest landscapes. So not exactly the same style. Um, so we were scratching our heads and we, didn't, we thought our projection was broken somehow. Uh, but then when we looked at the actual images that were clustered there, they're all sketches. And it turns out that uh, both uh, made sketches that are found in the data set that was used to train this model. Um, so um, I'll be honest, we're not winning a Turing Award anytime soon with this observation, but I think it's a fun anecdote to share nevertheless. Um, kind of shows the sort of surprises or insights that you can gain by um, looking at uh, these film parameter values and how they cluster across uh, different axes. Okay, so I, I was pointing out all of these examples to give you a flavor of the sort of analyses one can run uh, on, on film parameters uh, of trained task conditional models. Um, in this lecture, I voluntarily refrain from speculating on sci scientific applications uh, because frankly, I think you're in a better, better position to judge of that than I am. Um, what I do hope is that by showing you different learning perspectives and several application examples, you'll be better equipped to draw connections to your own research problems. Um, as a closing remark and a good segue into the next lecture, I think uh, I'll highlight again the topic of interpretability. Uh, so for some applications, it, it's sufficient to treat deep learning as an engineering discipline. And I don't think I have to tell you that for scientific applications, uh, it, is, it is not. It's important to treat the models as more than just black boxes that map from an input to an output. Uh, in that regard, Feature-wise transformations, I think, operate at a level of granularity that is well suited for performing analyses because, as the name implies, they act at the feature level. Um, so as, as we saw, when applying feature-wise transformations in the task conditioning setting, the, the post-talk analyses uh, we did can give us a sense of how tasks cluster in their modulating effect on individual features. Um, and we can use this uh, information then to formulate hypothesis about their purpose. Uh, of course, this is still a very manual labor, but I think um, there's great value in pushing those ideas forward and, and automating that process somehow. I think that could uh, be very beneficial for interpreting the models. Um, and personally, I feel like I've just scratched the surface when it comes to interpreting feature-wise transformations. An area where I think there's great potential uh, personally, if I, if I had to make a prediction, is uh, in the area of performing interventions on the model after it is trained and asking counterfactual questions about the model. So to, to, to give you a really small example of that, uh, think back of visual reasoning and think back of the sorts of questions we could ask uh, the model. So we could ask a question like, uh, how many blue cubes are there? Uh, and then we could artificially uh, intervene in that question uh, changing maybe just one word, uh, for instance, ask, asking about red objects rather than blue objects, and then looking at the differences in uh, the statistical properties of the activations at different places in the network. So I think these sorts of uh, counterfactual interventions could, uh, could perhaps give us more insights into how the model is operating. Okay, I think this is a good place to stop, so thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, and once again, if you're curious to know more about feature-wise transformations, you can look up the distal article. Um, I also included a list of references at the end of these slides um, for papers I mentioned in uh, the lecture. Uh, so I think we still have perhaps, what, 10, 10 minutes for questions. And like I said, I'm there at the break if you, uh, if you have other questions. So I'm, I'm ready to take your questions if you have them. Thanks.